The front lines in Ukraine are moving at the fastest rate for months as Ukraine's forces advance in the north but have been forced to retreat in the east where Russia continues to threaten a strategic breakthrough as it advances on the key town of Pokrovsk. My name is Jerome Starkey, I'm the defense editor at The Sun newspaper, and this is Frontline, your weekly roundup of the most important news from the war in Ukraine. I'm speaking to you today from Sumy in northeastern Ukraine, and we start with Ukraine's advance, its lightning assault into neighboring Kursk. Ukrainian forces continue to advance in Kursk, although their advances have slowed down. Their forces have also taken ground in Kupiansk, in eastern Kharkiv province, uh, where troops have been fighting back and forth for months. But further to the east, around the key town of Pokrovsk, Russian forces are continuing to take ground. And there are various reasons Ukrainian commanders have suggested for that, but exhaustion uh, among their own forces seems to be one of them and a lack of sufficient artillery shells. Suggestions Russian forces are firing 10 times as many shells at the Ukrainians in that direction. Russia's ambition to capture Prokrovsk would potentially make a strategic breakthrough on that eastern Donbass front because the town uh, home to a major railway junction and road junction uh, could then be a springboard for further attacks against the key city of Dnipro and possibly also uh, against Zaporizhia further to the south. The movement on the battlefield is exceptional because for many months we've talked about the fact how the fighting had largely stagnated and was characterized by these slow grinding assaults where Russia was advancing, paying a huge price in terms of men and military uh, material. The pace of advances has changed for both sides, but as one moves north uh, into sovereign Russian Kursk and indeed retaking territory in Kharkiv, the other side Russia advancing in the east. It's a bit like squeezing a balloon as, as one side loses ground in one place, it advances in the other. Ukraine's commander-in-chief, General Oleksandr Sersky, has this week released some extraordinary statistics about the number of missile and drone strikes that Ukraine has endured since the start of the full-scale invasion, more than 900 days, uh, two and a half years ago. Uh, Broadly speaking, he said that Ukraine had been hit by 24,000 drone and missile strikes since the start of the war. Those had broadly targeted around 13,000 installations was the word he used. But of those, uh, more than 6,000, the majority were against civilian installations. But he did acknowledge that over 5,000 had hit military installations as well. And in those statistics from General Sersky uh, was the revelation that actually only a small fraction overall had been shot down by Ukraine's air defences. Now, the timing of this release uh, is potentially significant because we know that President Volodymyr Zelensky and the Ukrainian government continues to pressure its Western allies for permission to use the full range of weapons in their arsenal against targets inside Russia. And we also know that they continue to ask for more of the weapons they've got and crucially more ammunition to use them. Air defence has been key for Ukraine throughout this year. And that announcement from General Sersky came as Moscow faced what its mayor called one of the largest drone attacks on the city uh, since the start of the war. Uh, the Moscow mayor said that at least 11 Ukrainian drones were shot down uh, on the night of the 21st to the 22nd uh, of August, and that was part of a broader attack across Russia of 45 uh, drones. 23 of those, uh, we understand, in Bryansk, six in Belgorod, uh, and two uh, attacking Kursk, where Ukrainian forces are fighting. While we're in Kursk, just quickly, the Russian officials have accused Ukraine of nuclear terrorism for what they claim are attacks against the Kursk nuclear power plant. At the same time, other Russian officials have said that when UN inspectors visit that plant uh, in the coming week, they do not expect them uh, to suggest that Ukrainian actions are endangering nuclear safety. So mixed messages coming out of Russia. Ukraine has accused 
Russia at the same time of putting nuclear safety at the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant at risk. The Zaporizhia plant, Europe's largest, is in occupied Ukrainian territory. Also on the battlefield, uh, as are connected to what's happening in Kursk, there are reports of Russian reinforcements, particularly VDV airborne fighters, moving from uh, the front lines, particularly possibly around uh, Robotny, uh, which is in Zaporizhia near Orekhiv, site of the focus of Ukraine's counteroffensive last year. Suggestion that uh, airborne Russian VDV airborne soldiers have moved from there to Kursk to reinforce the soldiers fighting in Kursk. That tells us a couple of things. That we, what we already know is that Russia was not prepared for that invasion of Kursk. They've been scrambling uh, to halt and slow the Ukrainian advance, and they've had to move in reinforcements. Uh, we've known there have been reports before of them moving these enforcements from the line in Ukraine and also from Kaliningrad, but more specific information there uh, about where those Russian soldiers are coming from, uh, the calibre of those Russian soldiers, the VDV historically elite Russian forces, although uh, many of those regiments have been so obliterated by the fighting in Ukraine that the characterization rather as elite uh, may no longer uh, be accurate. Uh, the final thing to discuss today is what's been happening uh, in and around occupied Crimea, and that is that Ukraine's navy has today taken responsibility for a strike on a Russian ferry that was carrying or was due to carry fuel uh, from a port on the Kerch Strait to occupied Crimea. Uh, that ferry was struck earlier this week. A huge fire ensued. We understand from Russian officials the ferry has now sunk and Ukraine has taken responsibility for that. And that fits into a broader, longer pattern of Ukraine deliberately targeting oil refineries, oil storage sites and logistics routes and mechanisms to try and limit Russia's ability to resupply its own troops. As ever, if you're watching on YouTube and you have any questions, please do ask them in the comments below. If you are commenting below, please keep it polite. I do get in there myself and I'll try and answer some questions as well. A few questions from last week and thank you for them. Number one, why doesn't the UK open factories and build tens of thousands of drones? Because you've noticed quite rightly that drones are one of the weapons transforming modern warfare. Well, the short answer is the UK is increasing its drone production. It's also increased and pledged to send uh, Ukraine huge numbers of drones to support its fight in this conflict. But by the same token, many people suggesting that the rate of industrial production, not just in the UK, but across uh, many NATO countries is insufficient and suggesting that those NATO countries need to ramp up production, not just of drones, but of other uh, weapons and ammunition as well to prepare themselves uh, to deter conflict and indeed to continue to arm Ukraine. Uh, one of you asking how many F-16s have arrived, the short answer is uh, I don't know that the answer. That's unlikely to be made public by the Ukrainians for obvious operational security reasons. But again, we know President Zelensky has confirmed that the F-16s are now here, at least some of them are now here. Those were promised uh, by the Danes uh, and the Dutch among others. A question about Kursk, why doesn't Ukraine hit the convoys uh, that are resupplying those or attempting to resupply those troops? It's a good question. Uh, Ukraine may have tried to do that. I can't rule it out. Convoys by their nature when they're moving uh, are hard to hit because they're not in one place for a very long time and details of their routes and movements are kept secret. But Perhaps more significantly, what we do know is that Ukraine has hit three bridges over the same river, S-E-Y-M, same river uh, in Kursk, to the west of the territory that they have invaded and now hold. Now, that appears to be a deliberate attempt to isolate Russian forces. By some suggestions, 3,000 Russian forces may have been cut off by those attacks on that, those bridges. Uh, we've seen Russian forces trying to put down pontoon bridges. Unclear whether that's to get reinforcements in or to get those soldiers out. But clearly, Ukraine is targeting Russian logistics significantly uh, and, and in a sustained fashion over many, many months. And so not just on the tactical level there in Kursk, but also far deeper, hitting those airfields, oil storage, refinery sites uh, and train lines indeed across Russia for many months. The final question also on Kursk, what happens when the Russian army arrives in 
curse. That's a reflection of the idea that Ukraine was to begin with in this occasion on this offensive fighting border guards and unprepared conscripts. And now more experienced soldiers are coming in. It's a good question. We wait to see. Uh, certainly the advent, the arrival of more experienced Russian soldiers could spell trouble for Ukraine. But even now, uh, more than two weeks into this offensive, Ukraine continues to make advances on Russian soil. As ever, thank you for watching. If you do have any questions, please ask them in the comments below if you're watching on YouTube, and I will endeavor uh, to answer as many of them as I can next time, and the rest I'll try and answer in the comments as well.